Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Welcome back, Dr. Smith, for uh, Sunday Gospel Reflection here. We have a uh, kind of a, a, a double a double feast. To it. Not the, of course, Sunday is the day of the resurrection, but it's also this year the Solemnity of All Saints. Yeah, very timely. It's yeah. great. Great Absolutely. reading this week. Oh, we have great reading. So yeah, we kind of jump out of our normal kind of Old Testament, New Testament cycle and just go it's almost like it's it's uh it's easter all over again we're all you know right into the into the new testament from the uh the first reading is from the book of revelation uh chapter 7 verse 2 through 4 and 9 through 14 so revelation if you write these down revelation chapter 7 verse 2 through 4 and then uh verses 9 through 14 of, of chapter 7 the responsorial psalm from psalm 24 and then the gospel from Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 through 12. The epistle from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. So um, so let's take a look at this. You know, just as we get started here, we do have a study on our um, on our ICC website on, on the book of Revelation. Um, and uh, so you're more than welcome to go take a look at that. Uh, it's a study my brother did, Father Sebastian. Uh, Carnazzo did on on the book of Revelation. So you're welcome to if you want to kind of jump in into that and do a more intensive study. But here we are in chapter seven of the book of Revelation. Let's go ahead and give the reading, and then uh, and Doctor will turn to you for the exegesis. I John saw another angel come up from the east, holding the seal of the living God. He cried out in a loud voice to the four angels who were given power to damage the land and the sea. Quote, do not damage the land or the sea or the trees until we put the seal on the foreheads of the servants of God, of our God. I heard the number of those who had been marked with the seal, 144,000 marked from every tribe of the children of Israel. After this, I had a vision of a great multitude which no one could count, from every nation, race, people, and tongue. They stood before the throne and the, before the Lamb, wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, Salvation comes from our God, who is seated on the throne, and from the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They prostrated themselves before the throne worshiped God and exclaimed, Amen. Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor, power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders spoke up and said to me, Who are these wearing white robes? And where did they come from? I said to him, My Lord, you are the one who knows. He said to me, These are the ones who have survived the time of great distress. They are washed, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Doctor, the book of Revelation is, uh, at least for a modern reader, one of the more confusing books. And I'd say one of the most abused in mm -hmm. the sense that many, many will, will read verses out of it, uh, apply it to the end times, uh, types of prophecies, and so forth. Uh, never really understanding what John meant. And a lot of the things John was writing here are difficult for us to understand unless we're steeped in a, a kind of a biblical worldview. So in, uh, you know, in five minutes or less, can you baptize us into that biblical yeah. worldview so that we can read this, this text from jo Revelation yeah. 7 as it was originally meant? Right. Well, I certainly am excited that we're on this All Saints Day looking at this text. It's a beautiful text, but I think it does, as you said rightly, Father, frighten a lot of people, but it shouldn't. It actually is a great book of consolation and a great book of hope. And a lot of the damage that has been done, uh, we need to really um, deconstruct that and come at it from a Catholic biblical perspective. Uh, in addition to your book study, I have one on my website on the book of Revelation. There's also a nice little book 
It's a slim commentary by Michael Gorman, G-O-R-M-A-N. I like the title. It's called Reading Revelation Responsibly. And he goes after all these kind of, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses and fundamentalists and trying to read in the, the politics of the day. And all that really is out of place. But maybe we can start by going back to chapter one. You know, the first thing I say is this is not really the revelation of John. Sometimes we call it that. But look at chapter one, verse one. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and all that he saw. And then there's this blessing, one of many in the book. It's kind of interesting that we have coming up, Father, the Beatitudes with the word blessed, because there are seven blessings scattered across this book. And if you get a good study Bible, they'll like the Ignatius study Bible that lays out and gives you the text for all those. We won't do it here, but there's a number of blessings. The first one is this, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. So it's a book of blessings. Um, the next thing I'd say, if you go um, look at the next verse, chapter one, verse four, is this is a letter, right? And we may have a map here. You can see if you look at uh, what is really today in Western Turkey, uh, the seven churches, right? And the central one, Ephesus, where we kind of begin, that's Paul's own home for many years. Of course, this is where the Blessed Virgin Mary and John share a home and where it said John has his, spends his letter days, which leads many to believe that this letter or series of letters is given near the end of his life. And that's what most people believe the book was written, one of the last books of the, of the, old, of the New Testament in maybe around 90 uh, to 100 AD. However, there are other scholars who believe that there is evidence within the book that suggests that it's written earlier, perhaps as early as 66 to 70, before the destruction of the temple. Now, for us, it really doesn't make a difference at the end of the day, but those who believe the book is written earlier in 66 to 70 interpret some of those signs and symbols in the book under the reign of Nero. And uh, so we have two possibilities. If it's written in the 60s, then who might be in the background is Nero sitting on the throne. And if it's written in the 90s, it would be Domitian. Now, both of these are times of persecution. So it works either way. But the scholars, Scott Hahn, others who believe it's written in the 60s suggest that that horror of Babylon and all that business is really taking aim not so much at, at this foreign entity of Rome, but really a lot of it is from apostate Jews and others who rejected the truth of the gospel closer to home in Jerusalem. So it's sort of like, and you can see that if you look at the, 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 the seven letters, right? In one of the letters, it talks about the synagogue of Satan, right? That's not a, it's not a, a very complimentary uh, you know, description there. So it's clear that, that what John seems to be seeing is that there are different levels of persecution. Some are coming from the broader Jewish community and then others from them. And I think that's about as much as we can say here for our purposes. But the point is to not bring it forward into the 20th century and make it, you know, Adolf Hitler, Saddam Hussein, or Donald Trump, or Joe Biden, or Barack Obama, <laughs> or, you know, a thousand other people there. I mean, you know, and we'll talk about this when we get into the exegesis here in a second with the 144,000 and some of these ways. See, it's, it's because the book is an apocalyptic book and people are, are really not used to it, it's ripe to be interpreted in all sorts of uh, incongruous ways, incongruent with the message of the gospel, right? And we have to remember, this is a book that is not written in the 20th century. It's written by the Apostle John, and it's rooted in the first century. And so a lot of the imagery here is going to be, would have made a lot more sense, even though it's veiled to those first century Christians. So let's take a look here at the text itself. There's, there's this initial uh, kind of a discussion between uh, the, the, the angel says, you know, it comes up from the east and says it's regarding the land about this dis coming destruction. And then it identifies these people who receive a seal on their forehead. They are uh, they're, they're the servants of God, a seal on their forehead. I, which, <laughs> by the way, like you're saying, this cause for us modern, uh, you know, readers, like this kind of weird, stuff that maybe is like sci-fi. <laughs> right. I heard the number of those who had been marked with the seal, 144,000 marked from every tribe of the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. So help us understand in those days what it would have been a seal. What is, what is a seal? And then who are these 144,000 or what is it supposed to represent? 
Yeah. Well, firstly, the seal. It's mentioned uh, a couple different times in the book. And first of all, just so people are clear, uh, you first have these seven seals. That's a different whole matter, right? So let's be clear about that. The seven seals, which are opened by the Lamb, who is the resurrected uh, Christ, are a set of judgments. So we have seven seals followed by uh, seven trumpets and then seven flagons or bowls. And we'll talk more about those, uh, those, those judgments, those 21 in all judgments. This seal is of another kind. Uh, turn to Revelation 9 for a minute. It's just a chapter over or two. And chapter 9, verse 4, um, talking here in chapter 9, the angels, uh, it, says, it says, they're told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or tree, but only those who do not have the seal, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that tells us that in chapter seven here, this seal is a kind of a mark of, of protection and ownership. So it's this kind of sense that those who belong to God will be protected, right? There's a sense in which they're gonna be blessed, they're gonna be protected. They will be given in some sense uh, the, the, the perseverance to make it through these trials. But about the 144,000 we see here in verse four, all this really is, Father, is uh, a little bit of uh, arithmetic here. We, we know that there were 12 tribes of Israel. So when you take the number of the tribes and multiply that by uh, 12 and then multiply that by 1,000, you get this kind of beautiful number of 144,000, which there are some sectarian groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses mm -hmm. and some other fundamentalists who would claim that this is the number of people that are going to be allowed or limited into heaven. And that, that plays into their kind of broken down theology of you must join the JWs because we're the chosen few. And that's just so much nonsense. I mean, you don't even have to have a PhD to see that in verses uh, five through eight, what, you know, or verse nine, you have this great multitude. So I always wanna ask them when they ring my doorbell, you know, what about them, right? Look at verse nine. Um, in chapter seven, verse nine, we read, after this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number. And I wanna say, hey guys, what about that, right? And so what you have here is, a, a kind of a twofold blessing, right? Remember, Jesus Christ came first to the house of Israel and then to all the world. We see that in his great commission, right? Go, look, let's look just for a second at Matthew chapter 28. I want to remind people about this, to not get caught up in these, in these unusual and false interpretations. Come back to this beautiful promise, right, of the great commission, right? Look at Matthew 28, verse 19. Jesus Christ says, go there and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then elsewhere, we read how, you know, the gospel was to go from Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And so this kind of notion that, you know, it's only going to be this select group of people, it completely mishandles the book of Revelation. And it's also uh, really inappropriate when you look at it in terms of the New Testament overall. So we have this great multitude that John can't see the end of it, right? And that's the great hope that we are a part of as as Gentiles, right, as the, the Christians that fill the earth beyond the, the, the Jewish Christians, which is to say that this is a number that John sees that can't even be counted. There's just so many. And this reminds us of the promises too of Abraham, right, that Abraham was told back in the Old Testament in Genesis 12, right, that he would be a father of many nations. But the way that Jehovah's Witnesses and other sectarian groups uh, would, would have it, that's really only them. And this is, this is really a We've seen this throughout the ages, right? Whenever there's a heretical movement or teaching, it's usually we have the answer. We're the chosen ones. We saw this with the, the Waco tragedy um, a number of years ago. They're the chosen ones. And that can lead into dangerous interpretations. And in that case, it even led to a great and horrific tragedy. So come back yeah. to the, the truth of the gospel here. Yeah, well, so let's get back to the, this, this thing. What is this seal on their foreheads? And then it does seem like there's two different groups of people. There's this 144,000. He started to say something about this. this it's kind of 12, the 12 tribes, and now we've got 12,000 from each of the tribes. I immediately, in my limited biblical training, uh, you know, I, I know that sometimes these symbolic numbers are given like as a fullness uh, and, and so forth, like, you know, that, that all are gathered in. Um, and then you have this second thing, a great multitude, and then these people are wearing the white robes with hmm. palm branches in their hands, which oftentimes is, is, uh, is uh, depicted in some like the mosaics in Rome and things like that. You see these depictions are very beautiful. So help and, us understand they, what and a lot of this stuff, Father, 
oh, sorry, a lot of this stuff comes back from the Old Testament. If we had time to really go into a, a full study, we'd see that a lot of these images come out of the book of Ezekiel and Daniel. For example, in Daniel 11.35, you have the, the righteous ones that are cleansed in white robes. And so John, in his vision here, is kind of painting a picture of, of the heavenly glory of the saints and angels around the throne of God, right? And so those that are marked are the righteous ones. And I think it's beautiful that he mentions these 144,000, which is to say that there's this, this beautiful hope that all of those Jews who believed in Jesus Christ will make it to, that, to the heavenly throne room. Paul cries out about this in, in Romans uh, 9 through 11, this great hope that there would be many that would be grafted in, right? And so we can't forget that there are you know, many Jews who did honor and acknowledge Christ. All the first Christians really were Jews. And so it's a beautiful hope that it begins there, but then it goes out to this kind of almost infinite number. And we ought to remember that you know, every day that the Lord tarries, every day that the Lord waits before he comes in his glorious second coming is another opportunity for more people to enter into the kingdom of God that Jesus is going to tell us about in, in Matthew 5 in just a moment. You know, um, just one, one more, just a little bit more on this, and then we'll, we'll move on. I, the, um, I think that, you know, the church fathers has seen this seal, the sign of the cross on, on the foreheads mm -hmm. of, the, of the, like you're saying, of the Jews that had accepted Christ. And then, and then we get this beautiful image of the wearing of the white robe, which, of course, reminds us of the baptismal robe. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then holding the palm branches in their hands, which is that kind of declaration that Jesus is their king, as a, we remember from Palm Sunday. Um, also becomes a symbol of those that had given their life for Christ. Um, yeah. I was just going to add that, you know, yeah. sorry, I, I think I mentioned Scott Hahn earlier. A lot of listeners may be familiar with him. It's helpful to recall this, this kind of great witness and biblical uh, uh, scholar was a Presbyterian and had no love for the Catholic Church. But one of the first books he began studying that helped lead him into the church is the book of Revelation. He later wrote about this in a book a lot will know called The Lamb's Supper. It's about Revelation. And I mean, it'd be a fascinating study to go through and look at or a book because he talks about all these images that you're getting at, Father, are, are really images of the heavenly liturgy. So when we participate in the worship at mass, it's, it's not as though the angels and saints are joining us. It's the other way around. It's they're always praising God, right? And we are taken up, right, when we come to the altar and we bring our gifts and we bring our prayer and we receive the Eucharist, we're taken up into that unending liturgy that's being described right here. You know, I think, I think we'll just, uh, with one verse, just to follow up on what you're saying, it might be like a key to help you unlock the door here. Coming back to chapter one of uh, the book of Revelation here, um, and, and this is John speaking in verse 10, says, uh, actually, let's go to verse nine. I, John, your brother, who shared with you in Jesus the tribulation, the kingdom, and the, and the patient endurance, uh, was on the island of Patmos on account of the word of the Lord and the testimony of Jesus. Of course, he had been, they tried to martyr him by throwing him in boiling oil, and he didn't die. So, you know, of course, they're like, whoa, better get this guy out of Rome, get him, <laughs> exile him to Patmos. So then, it, but then here's the key that unlocks the, like you're saying, I was in the spirit mm. on the Lord's day. He's, what does it mean to be in the spirit of the Lord's day? Of course, is, is, to, is to be, is, uh, the Lord's day is, 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 is Sunday, the day of the resurrection. And then to be in the spirit on the Lord's day is to be worshiping the Lord. And so John the, uh, is, is here and, and suddenly the, the liturgy that he's celebrating is transformed. And he sees no longer symbols, but reality mm -hmm. of what those symbols were pointing to. Mm -hmm. um, everything is him becomes incarnate, if you will, around him, the angels and so forth. And he sees the lamb the Eucharist, uh, and, and, um, and, and the whole of the book of Revelation. Right? Like you mentioned Scott Hahn's book on this, The Spirit of the Liturgy. No, no, that's, uh, that's uh, Pope Benedict's book, but uh, the, what, the Supper of the Lamb. Yeah, that, the Lamb's Supper, right? The yeah. Lamb's Supper, a very nice, very nice interpretation. So here it is on the Feast of All Saints. I'll give you one last word here, yeah. um, and then we'll move on in our text. Yeah, the last thing I want to just say again is, this is a book of consolation. And, you know, I mentioned that you, you know, a lot of people see this book of judgment, gloom and doom. But, you know, I mentioned these seven uh, seals and then seven uh, trumpets and seven bowls. After the first six uh, of the seals and after the first six of the trumpets, there's an intermission between the sixth and seventh. And that's what we're actually in right here, this intermission, where in between, before the final one, there's this kind of 
invitation to come forward. And that's done twice in the book. And what that tells us is even when we're seeing these final judgments on creation here, right, which have been long postponed in God's mercy, even then God is merciful and he's waiting. He's waiting for more to enter in. And that's the context of this beautiful scene we're in where we see the 144,000 and then the infinite, nearly infinite number on the uncountable number. God is always calling his faithful to him, always. Let's, um, let, with those words of God calling his faithful to him, let's look, take a look here at Psalm 24, uh, where we repeat, Lord, this is the people who longs to see your face. And, you know, I, I think this is very important as we continue here our feast of, of, of all saints and prepare ourselves for the feast. We take a look a few verses into this responsorial psalm. One who's, who, say, who can ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place, right? Who is it, who is it that can say that we are his people? Well, it's right here. One whose hands are sinless, whose heart is clean, who desires not what is vain. And, you know, I hope you'll be, you'll be uh, studying this with us in the uh, days leading up to this Sunday. The best thing you can do is to go to holy confession. Uh, to be cleansed of our sins, to make a, a heart which is clean, and then to rededicate ourselves to the work of the Lord. Uh, to, uh, this beautiful image of the sinless hands, because it was our first parents that used their hands for the fall of, of mankind. And so we are now blessed uh, as Christians to use our hands for the work of the Lord, to rededicate ourselves to that work, and then to say, Lord, here I am. We are your people, and we long to see your face. Yeah, it's, that's beautiful, Father. And I, I think, you know, what's really beautiful, too, about these readings, is that one of the threads I see going through the readings for All Saints Day is this whole notion of seeing his face. Now, if you just think about it for a minute, in the Old Testament, you've got a lot of figures who desired to see God's face or claimed to have seen their face. Think of uh, Moses, right, at the burning bush. And then later in Exodus 33, he says, Lord, show me your glory. The Lord says, no, right, but I'll, I'll give you kind of a glimpse of it. Uh, right here, I'm looking at Psalm 11, Psalm 11, verse 7. So a few, a few Psalms back, mm -hmm. Psalm 11, verse 7, for the Lord is righteous and he loves righteous deeds. And then it says, the upright shall behold his face. So it's another echo, right? But it's not until we come to John's gospel. If you look at John chapter one, right? Really interesting here. All these various saints and persons of the Old Testament that long to see his face, but John gives us the definitive New Testament answer. Let's just look at this one verse here. It's John chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, where John says, The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only Son who's in the bosom of the Father. He has made him known. I love that verse because it's almost like a commentary on all of this desire to see his face from Moses and Abraham, Elijah, Jacob, so many others. And it's sort of like saying, whatever they experienced was not actually seeing the face of God. Look at John 1, 1, right? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God, right? So it's only Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And then you look at verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have beheld his glory. That's John saying, look, it wasn't Moses. It wasn't Elijah. None of these other figures, Jacob. It, it's only in the incarnate Jesus that the apostles who beheld his face and now report to us the glory of that experience and that encounter. That's why we need the apostles, Father. That's why we need Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we need St. Paul, and we need the book of Revelation, because these are actually the ones who encountered the Lord in his holy presence. And then John, even further, is, gets this beautiful image we saw in the first reading of the glorified and risen Lamb. It's just, it's, yeah. it's so much and glory. Of course, in our baptism, then, we have an opportunity to participate, as we see in the, in the epistle for, appointed for today, this, I think if there's one thing I say we want to get across in this study is, um, is that the saints are not people way off in, you know, on Mars or something like that. But from a biblical perspective, the saints are those who have been baptized into Christ. Uh, and, and we've been given this newness of life, as St. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, the newness of life, which is God's way of life, which is why an after, the attribute or the, the, this, this idea of holiness, which is this attribute of God, is given to Christians, right? We call Christians by these, this name holy, saints, uh, it's the same word, uh, as we call the Lord because we have been made one with him. So let's take a That's look. Like, uh, Peter, Peter tells us this too, right? And we don't really emphasize this as much in the Western 
church, but you know this very well, Father, this whole notion Peter has in his epistle, being partakers, sharers, right? Mm -hmm. Participators in the divine nature, right? And that begins at baptism. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. It's Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 through 12. And again, I think when we're, don't be careful Catholics, it would become like Catholic comatose. We've heard this text so many times that we kind of like fall asleep. But no, what's being described is God's way of life. And now he's giving it to us as a gift, okay? Uh, chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, he, his disciples came to him and he began to teach them saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who per are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute and uh, persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you, false, you falsely for my sake. Uh, rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. Doctor, place us in the Gospel of Matthew now in the context of this passage. It's interesting for those in the Institute have been following along week after week. You know that we've been moving through the Gospel of Matthew, we've been moving, we've been edging further and further along as we go, right, over the last month or so. And we were just recently in uh, near the Olivet Discourse in Matthew uh, 24, Matthew 22 in there. So now it's interesting, we get like a rewind and we're back at that first of Jesus's major uh, homilies or discourses, of course, the Sermon on the Mount, which is chapter uh, five through seven. I actually had a seminarian father who told me, he goes, you know, he goes, I have one of these, uh, I know you don't prefer them, but these audio Bibles. And he said, I listened to the Sermon on the Mount. And he, I, he said, I think it, I timed it, it was like eight minutes or less than that. I mean, it's, there's so much truth packed in this entire, in these three chapters, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. But others will even say that the Beatitudes are in some sense, the totality of the entire gospel. So here at, in the beginning of Jesus's first major sermon, and you, you've been there, many Institute um, participants have been there and know you've got that beautiful octagon church for the eight Beatitudes. But the first thing we notice here is we have a kind of a, a little hidden comparison with Moses. Look at this, where it says, seeing the cross, he went up on the mountain and he sat down. And that's not because he was tired. The Lord was hardier than, than most, most people, right? I mean, he, he walked so much, he was strong, he's a carpenter's son. And so this is not about uh, he's sitting down to relax or something like that or be comfortable. It's really a teaching position. Now, in the, our Catholic tradition, you know, the person stands up, goes to the ambo and uh, says, proclaims the gospel and then gives a homily, perhaps. Right. No. But in the Jewish tradition, rabbinic tradition, you sit down. You see the same thing in Luke chapter four, where he goes to the synagogue and opens the scroll. Then he sat down. That's St. Luke telling us, OK, now listen closely. Here comes the sermon. So here it is, right? I think that's very important. The other thing I'd say here is we have some people with maybe less than stellar translations. And I bet there's some out there that have their Bibles right now where it says happy. Happy are uh, the poor in spirit. Happy are those who mourn and so on. And this is really a very, very poor translation. Uh, very postmodern. It's really not helpful. The Greek here is much more helpful. Makarios. It means fortunate or blessed. I think blessed is really the word we want. And uh, <clears throat> pardon me, it's found 13 times in Matthew. And uh, a number of them are right here. So what does that mean? Well, I think it's actually ironic. It doesn't mean uh, what happy means. In our culture, happy is a feeling. Happy is tied in the, in the temporal sense. And as you rightly said, Father, what Jesus is doing is giving us an, a picture. Right? He's painting a portrait of what it looks like to be in the kingdom of God. Now, let's look at a couple of these, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's all of these seem so, you know, counterintuitive. Why would it be that someone is poor in spirit? Well, the spiritually poor, right, as well as sometimes materially poor, um, are, are, are broken down to the point that they're not self-reliant, right? And so what, what Christ is saying is when you're an empty vessel, then I can fill you. But when you're grabbing onto life and trying to possess it, right, like that 
rich young ruler, right? Like that rich young ruler who went away a very, very sad man, right? Why? Because he was tied to his possessions, tied to his greed, tied to his wealth, right? Uh, but when we are open to the Lord and we surrender and we say all is yours, all is gift, then his grace can come in and fill us, right? Same thing with uh, verse six, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, right? Why, we would say, no, I want a Big Mac. I want Outback. I, you know, I want Chick-fil-A. I'm hungry, right? But what the Lord's talking about is the deeper spiritual hunger that he wants to inculcate in us. Because when we're hungry, then he can feed us. He feeds us with his word. He feeds us with his Eucharist. He feeds us with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And all the rest are all these other ones. So it's kind of turning upside down, right? The wisdom of the world. And we so much need this today because the world is constantly telling us, you need this and you need that to be happy. What we you know, need to be really happy is the Lord himself. You know, going, going back to the uh, Psalm 24 that we just said, right? The Lord, this is the people that longs to see your face. There's a desire in these people. And I, I um, uh, remembered, Doctor, um, a beautiful insight from Archbishop Elias Shakur, who is the Melkite Archbishop of Galilee. Um, who he spoke for the Institute a number of times. The listeners can go on our website, instituteofcatholicculture.org, and take a look at, uh, at, at Archbishop Elias Shakur's talk called Blood Brothers. But he had another book uh, called We Belong to the Land. And in that book, he has a beautiful interpretation of this. And I, I, I think you're going to enjoy this, Doctor. It's, it's a little bit of a long quote, but I think it's worth it. Hmm. And then we can go on to our, uh, uh, the epistle. He says this, Knowing Aramaic, the language of Jesus, has greatly enriched my understanding of Jesus' teachings. Because the Bible, as we know, it is, is, is a translation of a translation. We sometimes get a wrong impression. For example, we are accustomed to hearing the Beatitudes expressed passively. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be obtain mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And this, God, this is where this difference between this kind of passivity versus realizing that there's a, within that, within that passivity, there's also this desire, this hunger that comes out, right? If the person is poor, the one in the need is in need. Hmm. He, says, he says, blessed is the translation of the word, of the, of the word uh, makaroi, used in the Greek New Testament. However, when I further, when I look further back to Jesus Aramaic, I find that the original word was ashray. And the verb uh, from the verb yashar, ashray does not have this passive quality to it at all. Instead, it means to set yourself on the right way for the right goal, to turn mm -hmm. around and repent, to become straight or righteous. Uh, how could I go? And this is now, now you have to understand the archbishop had lived through the time of great persecution. He was a Palestinian boy when the state of Israel was established and he lo they lost their home. They were, and so forth. They were greatly persecuted. And he says, how can I go to a persecuted young man in a Palestinian refugee camp, for instance, and say, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, or blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of justice, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That man would revile me, saying, neither I, know, neither I nor my God understood his plight, and he would be right. When I understand Jesus' words in the Aramaic, I translate like this, go, get up, go ahead, do something, move. You who are hungry and thirsty for justice, for you shall be satisfied. Get up, go ahead, do something, move, you, you peacemakers, for you shall be called children of God. Uh, and, and That's wonderful. That beautiful. He, he concludes, he says, to me, this reflects Jesus' words and teachings much more accurately. I can hear him saying, get your hands dirty to build a human society for human beings. Otherwise, others will torture and murder the poor, the voiceless, and the powerless. Christianity is not passive, but active, energetic, alive, going beyond despair. I, and I, a doctor, I just go back to this response from Psalm, a one whose hands are sinless, whose heart is clean, who desires not what is vain. Yeah, it's really, that's, that's a beautiful reflection. And yeah. I, it reminds me a lot of what Pope Francis' you know, pontificate has really been about too, about you know, the, the smelling like the sheep and all that. I, yeah. think, I think just maybe one more point I would make before we go to the epistle, and it's just to look for a moment at verse 8. We've all seen it so many times, right? But let's look at it again. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Well, that's that theme we've seen running through all of these uh, readings, right? From the book of Revelation. And John himself is the one who had that vision, right? And he takes us up 
so that we can peer over his shoulder and see God in the book of Revelation, in all of his glory with all of his angels and saints around him. And then in the psalm, right, as you said, in terms of caring for the poor. And then now, certainly right here in Matthew, and then next we'll see it in the book of First John. And so it's really beautiful. We've got two readings from First John in, uh, on this Sunday from Revelation and also from his epistle, which I think we'll look at in a moment. But I think it's just such a beautiful way that is connected to all saints, right? Because they are the ones that we strive to imitate and to become like, right? They have become pure in heart. And let's not forget, many of them through martyrdom, through giving of the shedding of their blood and through martyrdom, right? Nevertheless, through even those persecutions that Jesus talks about here, right? In verse 11, they not only pass that test, but with such flying and vivid colors that we pray to them today because they are beholding God. Yeah. Well, I think I can't, I can't ask for a better bridge here into, into 1 John. Let's take a look at 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. 1 John, and that's almost at, the, almost at the end of your Bible. You go to the book of Revelation, come backwards a little bit there. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Beloved, See what love the Father has bestowed on us, that we may be called the children of God. Yet so we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. We do know that when it is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope based on him makes himself pure as he is pure. Doctor, I, 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 to be honest with you, I don't know if I could add anything to that. Maybe you have a word to say, but this is my, oh. my, my only thing is that, that the Feast of All Saints is our feast, not a feast for, for people far off from us, but for those that are surrounding us, especially as we gather together in, at, at Mass on Sunday. As you said, we are taken up into heaven. This is why the beautiful images of the church, of the saints, are always in the church. It drives me crazy to take the saints out of the church. Well, you, these are to remind us the, 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 this revelation that we are staying in the company of the saints singing, holy, holy, holy. And in that moment, you know, I think it's also important that these saints that have gone before us, these holy ones that are enjoying the, 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 the beatitude of God, are ones who struggled much like us. Mm. Um, and this, the struggle we face is, is one that they, they went through and, and through that struggle we're purified. Yeah, I, let, I can't add anything to that, but let, let, let me close my own remarks with that of the inspired uh, writer of Hebrews, whether it was Paul or someone else. We don't know who wrote that, right, it seems. In the old tradition, it was connected to Paul, and since then, the church has kind of raised a question mark. Is it someone from the Pauline circle? I know uh, Cardinal Van Hoy, who's a brilliant scholar, suggests it's Barnabas. Uh, Mary Healy uh, is another good scholar, and she suggests someone else from the kind of Pauline circle. But whoever it is, they gave us this beautiful and inspired book. Well, look at Hebrews chapter 12 to kind of just uh, conclude this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and like the book of Revelation here, is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And that takes us all the way back to Revelation chapter 7, at the throne of God where we desire to be. And in the meantime, we need to keep seeking his face in all of these ways that we've been talking about here. Beautiful. Well, Doctor, thank you so much. A blessing to everyone on this beautiful Feast of All Saints as we gather together. Raise up your voice to give glory to God who has shared his life with us. May the blessing of the Lord and his mercy be upon you through his grace and love for mankind at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Where all hearts receive glory.